This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Friends, welcome to worship with Shandon Presbyterian Church. Whoever you are, wherever you are, and whenever you might be watching, thank you for joining your spirit with ours during this time together. Shandon strives to be a place of genuine hospitality and authentic welcome. So know this, there is always a place for you here. In response to inquiries from some of you, we are putting together a Zoom gathering for those who are interested in learning more about who we are and what we do and what we believe. Some of you are interested in exploring the possibility of membership and we are glad to talk with you. If you would like to join us in this gathering or if you know of someone who might appreciate an invitation, please reach out to them or reach out to us and let us know so that we can be in touch with them. A reminder that in addition to our online worship, we also have outdoor worship taking place each Sunday now at 1 p.m. on the church lawn, as long as weather permits. We do need you to sign up in advance so that we are able to make sure our numbers are manageable and just to keep our safety protocols in place. Contact the church office if you need help signing up. Another reminder that Session has called our annual congregational meeting for Sunday, February 28th, 2021 at 5 p.m. on Zoom. We hope that as many as possible of you will join us. Not only will you hear a summary of 2020 and look ahead to the rest of 2021, you'll get to see the faces of so many people you have been missing lately. And you may also get to support local businesses because everyone who attends will be entered into a raffle to win a gift card to a nearby shop or restaurant. A word about Ash Wednesday, which is coming up this Wednesday, February 17th. You may drive through the portico that morning between 7.30 and 9 a.m. to receive ashes to go and or pick up your Lent worship bags from our pastoral staff. An online worship service will be available all day on Facebook and YouTube. An outdoor worship service will take place on the lawn at 12 noon. Again, please sign up in advance by contacting the church office or responding to the email prompt you'll receive. Ashes and Lent worship bags are actually available outside of the church right now and for the entirety of this next week, if that is more convenient for your schedule. You can come to the church doors right outside the offices and pick them up where they are waiting for you on tables. Today we are fortunate to be led in worship by Hannah Ratliff, our pastoral assistant who will be with us through the end of the summer, working primarily with John Cook in Ukirk and Discipleship Ministries. She is offering the sermon this week, and I am looking forward to that, and I hope that you are as well. Lastly, Scripture assures us time and time again that prayer is both powerful and effective. Trusting that this is true, we are praying especially for the following members of our community this week. Jean and Jim Christian, as they prepare for their daughter's upcoming surgery and as they grieve the death of Jean's mother. Belle Kinnett, mother of Richard Kinnett, as she is hospitalized. And the family and friends of Julie George, especially Barry George, upon Julie's death Thursday morning. And lastly, I thank you for the prayers you have offered for my family following my mother's heart attack and hospitalization. She is at home and is recovering nicely, and they too are grateful for the care you have extended them. Beloved, please join your voices with mine now as we call ourselves to worship. God's face is all around us. In the persistence of spring's first crocus, in the quiet suffering of our neighbor, in the crackling laughter of our friend. God's love takes many forms. The phone call from a loved one, the mask upon our faces, the casserole offered unsolicited. God is full of awesome power, but God chose to take the form of humanity to be nearer to us so that we might recognize God's love already present in the world. Let us worship the living God.
Let us draw near to God with sincerity of heart and full assurance of faith. Our guilty hearts sprinkled clean, our bodies washed with pure water. For through Christ we too can be changed. Let us confess our sins before God and one another, first together and then silently. Holy and almighty God, when we are filled with fear and we do not know what to say, when we sputter and flounder because your greatness is just so beautiful and our imperfection seems just so overwhelming, we boldly ask that you might forgive us, God. We are so often at a loss and we so often miss the mark. We neglect our neighbor, we squander our resources, we practice callousness when we should be tender. God of abiding love, remind us of the children you created us to be and help us try again today to find the right words, take the brave path and make your love known here and now. Amen. Hear the good news. As people born of water and the Spirit, we have died to the old life and a new life has begun. God's grace is poured into us day upon day upon day. Come to the water and remember your baptism. Be thankful and live as one who has been raised to new life. In Jesus Christ we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. On this day, live into the changed you, the forgiven you, the at peace you. Let the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you and also with you. And don't let it stop there. You have been changed, forgiven and at peace. Come down from the mountaintop, a new person, ready to share Christ's peace with each and every one you call, email, greet, meet, see, text, write. Share that now. Share that peace faithfully, fully, and freely this day and forevermore. At this time, I would like to welcome any children that we have worshiping with us and invite you to come a little bit closer to your screens for a special word together. I hope that you are well, and I am so glad that you are here in worship with us today of all days, because we are celebrating love. Now, some of you might know it's Valentine's Day, a day where we take as much time as we can to tell people how much we love them. And there are so many ways to tell people that, aren't there? You can give them a gift. You can make them some delicious food. That's my favorite. And you can just tell them out loud. You can say, I love you. And sometimes even if you don't want to say it out loud, you can say it through sign language. And those motions go like this. I love you. Can you try that with me? I love you. So even if you're far away or you need to say hey to someone through a window, you can still tell them how much you love them by doing that. I love you. 
And you know why we tell people that we love them? Because God first loved us. God loves us so much, in fact, that God sent Jesus to be here on earth with us, to teach us about God's love and to show us how to love one another better. That's the whole reason Jesus came, God's love. So today, as we celebrate love and all the people we love, I want you to remember just how very much you are loved and try to share that love with everyone you meet. Let us pray. Holy God, thank you for loving us. Thank you for sending your son Jesus to teach us about your love. Help us to love one another and help us to love you more. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Friends, will you join me in a word of prayer? Holy God, we pray that you would open our eyes, our ears, our hearts, and our minds, that we could hear you in words both old and new, to know you better. God, be near us now. Let us see your face and hear your voice once again. We pray all this in your holy name. Amen. Friends, today's scripture comes from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 9, verses 2 through 9. Listen now for a word from God. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became dazzling white such as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, 
who were talking with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say, for they were terrified. And then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud there came a voice. This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they saw no one with them anymore, but only Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, he ordered them to tell no one about what they had seen until after the Son of Man was risen from the dead. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So when you're a seminary student, people ask you almost ceaselessly about your call story. By the second or third seminary visiting weekend, you've usually got a tight paragraph that covers, more or less, how you wound up trying to get a degree in divinity. Some people are second, third, fourth generation clergy, and they're sure from a young age that they're going to follow in their parents' footsteps. Some folks talk about a big eureka moment where everything snapped into focus and they knew that God was calling them to ordained ministry. My own story was not quite so clear or concise. It involved a lifelong love of the church, a good deal of theological curiosity, and a lot of trial and error. There was, for me, not exactly an aha moment where the heavens opened and I heard God say, Hannah, get your degree from Columbia Theological Seminary, an MDiv preferably. But there was this slow realization, sort of like the moment in any good investigative thriller where the journalist connects all the dots on the corkboard and red thread, where I realized that all of my most significant relationships and all of my most formative experiences were thanks to the church. And I started to wonder if, in retrospect, this was how God had been quietly calling me all along. When we come across Peter and James and John in this passage, they're having a really hard time putting all the pieces together. When we meet them on this mountaintop, they've known that Jesus is special for a while now. They just witnessed him feeding the 4,000 and returning sight to a blind man. Peter even goes so far as to call Jesus the Messiah in the previous chapter. But Jesus is really frustrated with them because the disciples are close, but not quite there to understanding who he is. Immediately before this passage, Jesus sits them all down and explains very directly that pretty soon he's going to suffer greatly and be rejected and killed and then live again. Peter in particular doesn't get it and he tries to argue with Jesus about what will happen to him, which really doesn't go well. But this brings us to the mountaintop, where Jesus decides that the only way to make these guys understand that, yes, he is the living God, and yes, he's going to die, but he will return, is to just show them. So we get what sometimes is referred to as a preview of the resurrection. Jesus is transfigured into divine glory. He's robed in white blinding white, and he's joined by Moses and Elijah. And God's voice cut, cuts in from the heavens and really spells it out for them. This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. I find this passage so funny because it is so unbearably human. Peter has no idea what to say or what he's witnessing, much less what it all means, all he can manage to say is, it's good for us to be here. 
let's build three tents. Even when met with Christ in all his stunning glory, even when the voice of God thunders around them, even when the prophets show up to chat with Jesus, these poor disciples just aren't getting it. Mark says a verse later that when they return from the mountain, the disciples are still wondering what on earth Jesus could be talking about with all of this son of man risen from the dead business. Even this, Jesus's last ditch effort to try and find some way for them to understand what will happen to him, it doesn't quite seem to get through. And frankly, most of why I find this funny is because I see myself so clearly in their inability to hear what is so plainly being spelled out for them. Last spring, when coronavirus became a reality and my school canceled in-person classes indefinitely, my roommate Emily offered for me to join her at her family's farm a few hours away in rural Tennessee until life returned to normal. I thought that I'd stay for a week, maybe two until things settled down and then I'd go back to Atlanta and finish my degree and get back to life as planned. I ended up staying for two months, during which time the calves on the farm grew cuter and cuter with each passing day. Now, I was born and raised in the suburbs and have basically no exposure to wild animals of any kind so every day when Emily and I would walk down the long dirt driveway, I would try to coax the calves to come close enough to the fence so that I could pet them. Every day, they bolted in the other direction as soon as they heard us coming. And no matter how many times Emily politely but firmly explained that the cows did not and would not ever want me to pet them, it just wasn't computing. It didn't seem to matter how Jesus tried to explain it. The disciples, at least by Mark's account, they just couldn't seem to wrap their minds around the fact that the Messiah would suffer and die and live again. It just didn't fit with their understanding of what the Messiah would do and be and they couldn't imagine a world in which Jesus would or could be killed, much less conquer death and come back. As Emily, my roommate at Columbia, reminded me just today, it felt impossible for us just a few months ago to imagine a group of armed insurrectionists violently storming our nation's capital until it happened. In the same way, we couldn't imagine that the largest united movement for racial justice that our country has ever seen would come together in the middle of a pandemic until it happened. She said, I think we have to get creative and kind in order to start looking for where the resurrection might show up or what Elijah and Moses are doing there when they cross our paths. Friends, as we get ready this week to enter the season of penitence and preparation, of somberness and mourning, we're asked to remind ourselves of this truth that the disciples can't bring themselves to recognize yet, that suffering and death are indeed a part of this story. Many of us need no such reminder this year. Sometimes it feels as though we can scarcely think of much else. But friends, we spend Lent remembering and acknowledging Christ's suffering and death in preparation for the day that we know is coming, where we are reminded that death never, ever gets the last word. And Christ gives us this glimpse into that glory and triumph here if we can will ourselves to see and believe it. 
In my preaching class at Columbia, we had this weekly exercise where we were asked to observe our surroundings in a place that was unfamiliar to us. And then we were asked to write a parable seed about where we saw the kingdom of God around us. You could write your parable seed about something that you noticed in the international grocery store, in a park, in a waiting room, you name it. You just had to be still and look around you for long enough to see what was already there. It was kind of a hard assignment for me as someone who often doesn't recognize God's work until long after the fact. But after a while, I started noticing glimpses of God in real time. In the homegrown bouquet from a congregant that was left on the communion table. In the way that strangers at the store insisted that the other person take the last navel orange in the gentle and reassuring squeeze of a child's hand. Like Peter, Jesus is smacking us upside the head with grace and glory and little miracles all the time. And like Peter, we oftentimes still don't put the pieces together until we're staring at our cork boards full of red thread much, much later. But regardless, of when we come to recognize it, God's love is already alive and already quietly and persistently at work in our lives. The resurrection arrives, whether we know where to look for it or not. Amen.
Friends, let us gather our hearts together in prayer. Gracious God, we are weary, even if we go to bed at 9 p.m. This pandemic wears on and on. You say, come to me, all you who are weary, and you will give us rest. Perhaps you mean more than sleep. We are drained. We are drained of so much. Creativity for work, energy for family, ideas for more meals. You promise a living water that never runs dry. Perhaps that water fills us up even when it feels like there is a hole in our bucket. We are stumped. We are stumped about how to move forward as a nation. Even the words we use to describe our pain cause division. Even the stories we tell find their roots in different soils. You were the sprout that came from the stump of Jesse. You were the new life that came from the tomb. So perhaps our dead ends are not as overwhelming for you? We are grateful. We are grateful for things we never thought to be grateful for before. Zoom and Netflix and books and takeout, a bathroom door to hide behind. You are the giver of every good gift. And with all that we complain about, we are remiss in saying thank you enough. Will you still hear us? because we do thank you. We are hopeful. We are hopeful because of each selfie we see of someone getting their vaccine, and each stimulus check given to someone who may need it more, and each brave conversation we have about what really matters to us. All of that is a glimmer of what you dream for us. And you have always been one who sees more in us than we do in ourselves. You called us your children, after all, those made in your image, even those called to be a light to the world. But mostly, and most importantly, we are yours, which means that all of our mess of feelings are not hidden from you, and which means we are not beyond redeeming or rebuking or restoring or recalibrating. So this morning, or this evening, or whenever we find ourselves praying this prayer, O oh God, we say thank you. Thank you for your claiming, calming, clambering, challenging love that will not for the life of us let us go. With that gratitude first and foremost in our hearts, O oh God, we pray the way your Son taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. Friends, God's gifts rain down upon us like manna from heaven. Sometimes we recognize them and sometimes we don't. But God's presence is with us in either case. In this moment, we pause and remember the many times that God has been with us along the way, providing the things that we need. And now, through the ministries of this church, we are invited to join the work of God in providing for the needs of the world and our community. Let us now give our offering joyfully and generously.
friends, remember that the living God is already at work in the world, regardless of when we put the pieces together. I invite you now to go from this time into the world to live out the mission of the church. Go forth remembering that the love of God, the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit are with you now and always. Amen.